This July 4th, 2021, as the pandemic draws to an end in the United States, there is much to celebrate. But what is the full meaning of the independence in Independence Day that we are about to celebrate? And what exactly is it about that that we are celebrating? Well, welcome to New Ideal, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. Today, we're going to discuss this very topic, understanding the meaning of Independence Day. I'm Ben Baer, a fellow and instructor at ARI. Uh, with me is uh, Keith Lockich, my colleague at ARI, a, a senior fellow at ARI. Hi, Keith. Hi. And uh, to get this discussion started, we thought we would do something uh, a little different um, because in a way, I think uh, part of the answer that we want to give to this question today has already been put probably in better words than I, than I could put it um, by, uh, by those who have preceded us at ARI. In particular, I have in mind here uh, the, the first CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute, uh, Dr. Mike Berliner. And we have a video that Mike did uh, some years ago. This is actually one of the first YouTube videos that ARI ever put up from back in 2008. And so before saying anything more uh, of ours, we want to share, we want to play this video. Uh, it's a short video. It should take about four minutes. We've, uh, we've actually sped, in case anyone notices, we've sped it up just a little bit uh, to save us time. Um, but uh, let's, let's listen to what Mike had to say back in 2008, because I think uh, his words are of enduring significance uh, today. And we'll talk a little bit about, uh, more about why after we watch the video. So let's, let's play the video by Mike Berlin. America's cities and towns will soon fill with parades, fireworks, and barbecues. We'll be celebrating the 4th of July, this the 232nd birthday of America. But one hopes that the speeches will contain fewer bromides and more attention to exactly what is being celebrated. The 4th of July is Independence Day, but America's leaders and intellectuals have been trying to move us further and further away from the meaning of Independence Day away from the philosophy that created this country. What we hear from politicians, intellectuals, and the media is that independence is passe, that we've reached a new age of interdependence. We hear demands for mandatory volunteering to serve others for sacrifice to the nation. We hear demands from trust busters that successful companies be punished for being greedy and not serving society. But this is not the message of America. In fact, it is the direct opposite of why America became a beacon of hope for the oppressed throughout the world. They have come here to escape poverty and dictatorship. They have come here to lead their own lives where they aren't owned by the state, the community, or the tribe. Independence Day is a critically important name for a holiday. It signifies the fundamental meaning of this nation. The American Revolution remains unique in human history, a revolution and a nation founded on a moral principle, the principle of individual rights. Jefferson at Philadelphia and Washington at Valley Forge pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. For what? Not for mere separation from England, not like most rebels for the freedom to set up their own tyranny. In fact, Britain's tyranny over the colonists was mild compared to what most current governments do to their citizens. Jefferson and Washington fought a war for the principle of independence, meaning the moral right of an individual to live his own life as he sees fit. Independence was proclaimed in the declaration as the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What are these rights? The right to life means that every individual has a right to his own independent life, that your life belongs to you, not to others to use as they see fit. The right to liberty means the right to freedom of action, to act on your own judgment, the right not to have a gun pointed at your head and be forced to do what someone else commands. And the right to the pursuit of happiness means that you may properly pursue your own happiness, that is your own career, your own friends, your own hobbies, and not exist as a mere tool to serve the goals of others. The Founding Fathers did not proclaim a right to the attainment of happiness, knowing full well that such a policy would carry with it the obligation of others to make you happy and result in the enslavement of all to all. The Declaration of Independence was a declaration against servitude, not just servitude to the crown, but servitude to anyone. That some signers still own slaves does not negate the fact that they established the philosophy that doomed slavery. Now, political independence is not a primary. It rests on a more fundamental type of independence, the independence of the human mind. It is the ability of a human being to think for himself and guide his own life that makes 
political independence possible and necessary. The government as envisaged by the founding fathers existed to protect the freedom to think and the freedom to act on your own thinking. If human beings were unable to reason, unable to think for themselves, there would be no autonomy or independence for a government to protect. It is this independence that defines the American Revolution and the American spirit. To the founding fathers, there was no authority higher than the individual mind, not King George, not society, not God. Reason, wrote Ethan Allen, is the only oracle of man. And Thomas Jefferson advised us to fix reason firmly in her seat and call to her tribunal every fact, every opinion. Question with boldness, even the existence of a God. That is the meaning of independence. Trust in your own judgment, in reason. Do not sacrifice your mind to the state, the church, the race, the nation, or your neighbors. Independence is the foundation of America. Independence is what should be celebrated on Independence Day. That is the legacy our founding fathers left us. It is a legacy we should keep, not because it is a legacy, but because it is right and just. So it's hard to top that, I think. Um, what is there to say about it? There is uh, at least a couple major points I think we should highlight from, from what Mike said back in 2008. Um, one, to me, I think is really important is that Independence Day isn't just about pol the political independence of one nation from another. It's not just about declaring independence from Britain. Um, why is it that the, the colonists wanted to declare independence from Britain? Uh, it's not just because they had a problem with authority, as it were. It's that uh, they, they thought that the British government was violating their rights as free and independent individuals. And if you if you read the Declaration of Independence, and I just reread it yesterday, uh, and I think, you know, a lot of people should read it, you they give a long list of the uh, the different abuses of the British monarchy in that period, um, including and I'll just just a couple of the more noteworthy ones, obviously imposing taxation, without representation, restricting movement among uh, states, stopping the naturalization of foreigners, the list goes on. We'll, we'll mention some of the other ones shortly, but uh, it, not just the violations, the actual active violations of the colonists' rights, but more generally, they were objecting to the lack of political representation. Uh, everyone knows the slogan, no taxation without representation. And uh, this is deriving from a view they had of uh, the role of government, that if, if, as Jefferson put it in the declaration, government derives its just power, powers from the consent of the governed, uh, then some form of representation uh, was warranted. That's especially if you think that the job of a government is to protect the individual rights of its citizens. Then uh, if that's having a government that's subject to the consent of the governed is, is one of the important ways of, of saying government is not a master, it's a servant. It's a servant by way of performing the function of protecting rights and the people whose rights are to be protected need to have a say in how that's done. And, and the colonists weren't being given that say, and that's a big part of the reason that they uh, revolted. Yeah, and I think another important point in the video is that it, it, you know, it's not just about independence from Britain, but it's also not just about the removal of a negative to throw off the rule by Britain to stop the, quote, long train of abuses and usurpations that Jefferson talks about in the declaration. It was, a, it was a step towards the establishment of a whole new form of government, one that had never existed before. And, and again, the declaration to, to provide new guards for their future security. So the, the founders were deeply aware of all the various forms that tyranny can take, whether it's the rule of religious authority, uh, authorities under a theocracy, you know, whether it's the despotism of an absolute monarch, or whether it's unlimited majority rule under a pure democracy. And what they created was a totally new system of government instituted specifically to secure individual rights. I think that's an important thing that to thing to emphasize. Uh, one interesting thing that Mike says in the video is he, he points out that Britain's tyranny over the colonies was milder compared to what many governments do today. Um, and I, I the uh, it's interesting because the declaration. I had, a, I had a pause on that because the declaration does accuse the British 
of doing things that might seem worse than what we might be subject to today. He talks about the deprivation of due process. Um, you know, when the Americans objected and appealed for redress, they went to war, you know, Britain went to war against America. He pressed Americans into military, you know, involuntary conscription against their own country. So what do you think of, what do you make of that? Yeah, that stuff, I, I noticed that too. And that stuff is all pretty bad. But I think the, the important thing to look at here is the historical context, which is that those are the things that the British government are doing in response to the revolt that's already happened in America, in response to the protests, in response to the Boston Tea Party, uh, that like, the Tea Party and others, other forms of protest are happening over the relatively mild issues that precede it. And then, uh, you know, the king and the parliament, in effect, double down on the injustice uh, by saying, no, we're not going to uh, take you to court over this, uh, or we're not going to uh, get into a, a debate about what's the proper way to govern the colonies by, you know, giving you representation. Instead, they just send troops and start to, you know, pillage the coast. Uh, so, you know, it's, the point is that it's it's pretty mild at first what the what the colonists um, object to. And then mild in comparison to what? In comparison to what we're dealing with today, he mentions some examples from back in 2008. And, uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's hard to imagine if, uh, it's hard to know what Mike might have, might have thought we would be dealing with today in 2021. So he, he says, we are thought to be living in this world of interdependence, not independence. Well, now think about what we've been dealing with for the last year um, over the course of the pan pandemic, where we've all been given this slogan, we're all in this together. Uh, and the, the meaning of that all too often has been, we're all in this together because the government has decided to centrally plan and manage all of our lives uh, over the course of this pandemic by locking us all down um, deciding what kinds of risks we should be allowed to take, what kinds of risks we shouldn't be allowed to take. Uh, I mean, that's what the age of interdependence has meant in this past year. I suspect that part of what we're celebrating now this July is not so much the end of the pandemic uh, as, a, as a medical threat, but the end of the, or at least the, uh, <laughs> uh, the partial end of the, the, the overweening role of uh, government in our lives uh, over the past year. But some of the other examples that uh, Mike mentions are uh, even more pressing uh, today. So he talks about uh, mandatory volunteering. We just did a podcast uh, about a month ago on the brand new calls that are coming for mandatory national service from every side of the political aisle and all kinds of new legislation that's being introduced to do that. That's come back with a vengeance uh, since the pandemic uh, from, you know, in part from some perception that people weren't all in this together enough, even uh, during the pandemic. And so they need to be forced to be that way even more. Uh, and Mike also mentions the, the antitrust uh, legislation and, and, uh, and legal actions. And that has doubled, if not quadrupled, uh, since when he was talking about this in 2008. There have been all kinds of calls from politicians uh, on both sides of the political spectrum calling overtly for the breakup of the most success, some of the most successful companies, the tech companies. And we've also uh, covered that in, in recent podcasts. So, you know, we could go into more, uh, all kinds of other examples, uh, abuses coming from Democrats and uh, Republicans. And my point, and I don't think um, Mike's point, is that uh, the fact that things are even worse now than what the colonists were dealing with is necessarily a reason for us to have some kind of political revolution of our own. But the fact that uh, things are this bad and you don't get even more vocal opposition to these policies and that you get support from these policies from both sides of the political spectrum, that's, I think, what's really ominous today. And it, and it shows how far uh, we've come from living and practicing the philosophy of the founders. Yeah, I, I think it shows, unfortunately, how little people today truly understand or recognize what America represents in history and the real meaning of the founding of this country. So let's look at that. Let's look at that a little, a little more detail. Let's dig a little deeper here. 
Yeah, because I think the other major point that Mike hit, which is super important, is that the idea of independence that the American Revolution was based on, it wasn't just the political independence of America from Britain. It wasn't even simply the ability that we all have to live independently from each other and therefore the need to protect our individual rights. It was this much even deeper point that uh, underneath it all, that uh, part of the reason that the founders were even able to appreciate the importance of political independence uh, was their valuing of intellectual independence. Um, and it's, uh, it's hard to emphasize how significant this is historically because there's a temptation to kind of look at history through the lens of uh, our current philosophy. And this is the Ayn Rand Institute and we're objectivists and objectivism assigns a very important role to the virtue of independence. It's what uh, the fountainhead is all about, but it's, it's really true that, that in their, in explicit terms, the founding fathers had also identified the, the, the central crucial role of intellectual independence. Mike mentioned in his video uh, how Thomas Jefferson was so committed to the importance of guiding one's own life by reason. He, there's the famous quote about fixing reason firmly in its seat, questioning even uh, the existence of a God. And, and you know, uh, uh, Jefferson was serious about that. I mean, he was a kind of deist who, who didn't accept most of the trappings of uh, conventional religion. So he did quite a lot of thinking for himself. He was heavily influenced by the Enlightenment thinkers in this regard, who also uh, emphasized the, the same kind of virtue of intellectual independence. And Jefferson didn't just talk about this in the abstract. Uh, it wasn't just even a, a kind of rationale that he used to justify revolution against the British. It was something that he thought needed to be protected at home uh, in the colonies against the the potential uh, tyrants who might arise there. Uh, and, and Keith, you mentioned earlier how they weren't just rebelling against Britain, but they were setting up a new positive form of government of their own. And a really great example of that is uh, in connection with this value of intellectual independence is something that uh, Jefferson regarded as one of his three great achievements uh, of his life, the three that appear on his epitaph. Uh, it, interestingly, like being president didn't actually show up. The three great achievements were uh, the Declaration of Independence, the University of Virginia, and the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, which he wrote in 1777. So that's like while the revolution is going on, he's worried, how are we going to govern in a way that's consistent with these principles at home once we've gotten this political independence? That statute eventually passes in 1786. Uh, he authored it himself. And uh, it emphasizes things like that the, the human mind is free, it can't be changed through force, it's tyrannical to make someone support beliefs that he doesn't accept himself, the truth can only be discovered through free argument and debate. This is, of course, the legislation, the, the state legislation that eventually influenced uh, the Establishment Clause in the First Amendment to the Constitution. It's what informs our contemporary understanding of the separation of church and state. And this is all coming out of the spirit of the Enlightenment, the idea, uh, especially that you see in Locke's letter concerning toleration, uh, that people need to be left free to think for themselves because it is a positive virtue for them to think for themselves. They need to use their reason to figure out what's true. And this is something that Locke was, that Jefferson agreed with Locke about. And it's a real feature of what Jefferson was trying to protect with political independence, it was to protect the intellectual independence. Uh, the promo image that we used for the episode today has the inscription uh, at the Jefferson Memorial about how Jefferson swore allegiance against any form of tyranny over the mind of man. And that's whether it's British monarchy or, uh, or religious theocracy, as you, were, as you were saying, Keith. Yeah, you put it as this is in the spirit of the Enlightenment. I, I think it's really crucial to emphasize the fact that America was a product of the Enlightenment era. And it was the Enlightenment era that put this emphasis on the individual's reasoning mind as opposed to the blind acceptance of religious authority. This was a major factor in the founders thinking of the kind of government they wanted to establish, one that left people free to think independently and chart their own course in life. And it's because of that Enlightenment ideal that today, you know, the church 
doesn't have power that's established politically. You talked about the establishment clause, and that's stood the test of time for the most part. Um, on the other hand, the other trend that's happened over the last 200 years is that the ideals of the Enlightenment have largely been abandoned by our intellectual leaders today. And what we see are, are you know, if the church doesn't hold political power, what we see today are new doctrines. They're sort of almost quasi-religious doctrines that are gradually acquiring more and more political power. You think about environmentalism or sort of wokeism. Um, they get their power partly from reinforcing people's assumption that they're not free to discover the truth for themselves, pursue values for themselves. You know, think about the egalitarian idea that no one is self-made. You didn't build that, right? Um, or, you know, the sort of woke racial ideologies we see all around us where individualism and objectivity are seen as, you know, white supremacist tools. Um, the environmentalist view that if there's a dominant consensus about scientific claims, that demands conformity to certain political policies like spending trillions on green infrastructure. Um, so we see the, so with the waning of enlightenment ideals, we see the rise into politics of what you, of you, what you could think of as, as similarly irrational quasi-religious ideologies that are in, in certain ways replacing religion. Yeah, we actually did a podcast just a, a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, on that very topic on how a lot of the, the many of the contemporary uh, racial ideologies, for example, it, even though they pretend to be secular, have a deeply religious uh, a deeply religious style in their motivation and approach. Uh, this was the episode called "What to Expect from an America Without God." So, if you haven't seen that one, check it out. Um, before I say any more, I do want to thank a number of people who've just uh, recently contributed to our super chat. Thank you very much for your support. And if you are watching on YouTube, that is the best way to get your question to rise to the top of the queue. Uh, one question has come in already, and we'll we'll take a look at that probably later uh, at the end of the episode. Um, but yeah, Keith, uh, so you talked about how these these ideologies that are influencing the the uh, erosion of freedom in America are in part uh, motivated by premises that deny the fact that people can be intellectually independent. But there's another aspect of that, which is that it's not simply that the, the ideologies themselves deny the fact of our independence. It's that when people are accepting these ideologies, they're often not doing it critically. They're not being sufficiently intellectually independent on their own. Um, and that's especially insofar as a lot of these ideologies uh, involve core premises, especially about morality, uh, that very few people in our culture have been independent about, that very few people have thought critically about. And here I have in mind um, the fact that all of these ideologies, whether it's environmentalism or uh, religion or these various racial ideologies, they all encourage us to engage in some form of sacrifice for another that, that there's there's a there's an aggrieved party that's in need that 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 those of us who have uh, uh, resources or abilities need to give up to and if that's the case then it's this it's this common moral premise more than anything else that we need to really double down uh, on evaluating in an intellectually independent way and to that end, we thought it would also be a good idea to bring in some clips uh, from another earlier video that ARI did, uh, this time one from uh, Ankar Gatte. This is from back in 2007. Um, uh, this is when it was the 50th anniversary of uh, Ayn Rand's novel, Atlas Shrugged. And Ankar gave what I thought was a very provocative talk uh, on the subject of why there's an important sense in which Atlas Shrugged was America's second declaration of independence. And it has a lot to do with this issue of uh, what it means to be independent in your thinking about morality. So let's go ahead and play that first clip from Ankar's. And we've, we've sped this one up just a slightly slight bit as well, uh, but we'll play two clips. This first one is about three minutes. For the founding fathers, the motto, live free or die, had real meaning. Without freedom, they would be dead. Their mode of existence would be dead. Their unrelenting, unbowed pursuit of their own perfection would be dead. 
And so they fought. The Declaration of Independence was a declaration of self-esteem. It was a declaration of self-esteem. But the Founding Fathers' achievement is eroding. They would be shocked by the power that is now concentrated in the hands of the American government at the expense of the individual. Now, although the core of self-esteem is an earned confidence in one's power to think and to produce, which Americans have earned in abundance, full self-esteem requires that one self-consciously value oneself. Full self-esteem requires that one know in explicit moral terms that one is good and why. This positive moral evaluation and self-evaluation, the Declaration of Independence does not fully provide and the Founding Fathers could not provide. The European Enlightenment had promised to put morality on a rational, scientifically and mathematically precise foundation, but it could never deliver on its promise. And far too many of its intellectual leaders assumed that the content of morality would be essentially Christian morality, stripped of its mystical trappings and somehow defended by rational argument. The Founding Fathers agreed with the European intellectuals. Jefferson, for instance, made his own compilation of Jesus's teachings. Jefferson's compilation, which omits the miraculous from the New Testament, includes the Sermon on the Mount. Indeed, Jefferson in a letter refers to Jesus as, quote, the sublime preacher of the Sermon on the Mount, close quote. Now ask yourself this, does the Sermon on the Mount not indict Jefferson and the other founding fathers as evil? When the British struck America's right cheek, did Jefferson in the declaration tell America to turn to offer them the left? Did Jefferson love his enemies or did he go to war with them? Did Jefferson, who had a gallery of worthies in his home, portraits of men like Isaac Newton and John Locke, think that the blessed are the poor in spirit or that the only people worthy of admiration are those who choose to make something of their spirit? Did Jefferson and, and the other founding fathers think that the meek shall inherit the earth or that the rational and the industrious shall? Did Jefferson give up riches or did he seek them? On every essential, the founding fathers did the opposite of what the sermon commands. And that's because the Sermon on the Mount is a declaration of war on self-esteem, is a declaration of war on self-esteem. The founding fathers created a new form of government and thereby opened up a, con a continent to their kind of men, men of self-esteem, individuals who were ready to drop their backward cultures and work for a better future, individuals who valued themselves so highly that they sought the best for themselves and in themselves by coming to America. But the founding fathers left these people unable fully to understand or appreciate their own greatness, open to every form of abuse and vulnerable to every sort of moral denunciation. And the denunciation soon came. Remember live talks, Keith? <laughs> it would be great to get back to those uh, very soon. But uh, I thought that this part of Ankara's talk uh, was a really great illustration of the importance of intellectual independence in the way that one thinks about moral questions. Um, Jefferson, for example, was was a great champion of intellectual independence, as we talked about. He he gave that advice about fixing reason firmly in its seat. But it seems like even even Jefferson on this particular question could have could have used some more on his own. And the, the advice maybe he could have given himself was fix reason firmly in her seat and call to her tribunal every fact, every opinion, question with boldness, even the morality of self-sacrifice. Uh, which, uh, you know, he was willing to question God's existence even, but not this basic moral tradition that he had inherited from uh, Christianity in particular. And uh, uh, in, a, in a clip that we'll look at shortly, Ankar goes on to illustrate what it looks like to question boldly uh, even this morality. But it's, it's worth pointing out that like the, the problem here is not just with the founders. If anything, it gets worse as we advance in history. Uh, if you look at many major uh, political thinkers today, for example, even ones who are highly sympathetic to the philosophy of the founders, uh, many conservatives, many libertarians, uh, they will try to argue for and defend the American system and the American philosophy themselves on the basis of uh, religion or on the basis of the morality of altruism. Um, even when, for example, uh, some of the, they oppose uh, some of these statist collectivist policies that we were talking about earlier. Uh, it's, it's very interesting how the, their blind spot about the moral premises of these policies. So for instance, we talked about the lockdowns. Uh, so few of 
uh, critics of the lockdowns, and ARI has been among the critics of the lockdowns, have, have sought to question the right of a government uh, to impose with force on people's lives for, the, for their own good. Instead, they will say, well, it's a, you know, COVID isn't really a, a threat. It's, uh, there's a conspiracy to get us all vaccinated. They question like the scientific presuppositions of the lockdown policy. They don't question the moral presuppositions. And you can see this, especially when the chips are really down, uh, th that many of these same critics will then get on board. There were, there were uh, many Republican governors who went along with the lockdowns, just like the Democrats. And on the other policies that we talked about, uh, these are all bipartisan. Um, antitrust, uh, the pushes for more antitrust against tech companies, these are coming from the left and the right. National service, uh, mandatory national service, also very bipartisan. When there is no other way to oppose the policies, uh, like by questioning the science, when there's no way to oppose them other than by challenging the basic moral premises that people, you know, that people have a obligation uh, to to work for the good of others, then these conservatives and libertarians are helpless. The, their opposition falls apart. They usually just then get on board. Maybe they'll bicker about like to what extent it needs to be done. But there's no fundamental opposition. And I think that's because yeah, they're mean, not being critical enough about about the moral premises here. Yeah, I mean, this need that you're talking about to um, declare independence from our, our conventional moral assumptions. I mean, this was, this was a core theme of Ayn Rand's writings. In particular, in her view of intellectual history and the founding of America, you know, the idea that from the beginning, America was undercut by a contradiction between the morality that was implicit in its political philosophy, the idea of each individual's right to his own life, liberty, and the pursuit of his own happiness, which is an egoistic viewpoint. It's, the, it's a person's right to exist, each person's right to exist for his own sake. There's a contradiction between that implicit egoistic morality that was present at the founding versus the morality of altruism, which is the morality of the Sermon on the Mount, as Ankar puts it. And this is the, this is the moral perspective that's dominated Western civilization for 2,000 years. So her view is that you can't defend capitalism and the profit motive and the right to the pursuit of happiness, while at the same time upholding the idea that to be a good person means to sacrifice for the sake of others and to be like Jesus on the cross. It's a basic contradiction at America's founding. Um, and I think it's captured nicely uh, in the eloquently in the clip from Alcar's talk. And I think what he he goes on to argue that this contradiction can be resolved only by rejecting one of the two sides of the contradiction. So let's take a look at the second clip from uh, Ankar where he does just this. This is about three and a half minutes. Now to all of this, to whatever form, yeah. the sacrifice of men of self-esteem to men without self-esteem takes. Ayn Rand and Atlas Shrugged says, no more. In one of the world's great acts of independence, Ayn Rand declares in effect that the essence of the Sermon on the Mount, along with everything it presupposes and everything it implies is evil. The idea that the good consists in achieving the good of others of your neighbors, of your country, even of your enemies, of anyone or anything, real or imagined, that is not you. The idea that you must sacrifice your personal values with even, without even the expectation of return. The idea that nobility means being selfless and wickedness means being concerned with self. The idea that morality is synonymous with altruism and immorality is synonymous with egoism. All of this is challenged in Atlas Shrugged. On this, of this whole approach to good and evil, Ayn Rand asked questions no one dared to ask. What, she asked is the good according to this morality. Now, supposedly, it's that you achieve the good of others. But what then is their good? Well, presumably that they achieve the good of still other people. But then we're again faced with the same unanswered question. What is the good of these other people? This is the beginning of Ayn Rand's declaration of moral independence. To win one's moral independence, one must first say no to the corrupt ideal of sacrifice. One must reject as unspeakably evil any morality that demands sacrifices, whether the sacrifice of your values to the misfortune or irrationality of others, or the sacrifice of their values to your misfortune or irrationality, whether it be a relative demanding an attention he has not earned, or the latest healthcare scheme from Washington, promising to give us something for nothing by soaking the rich, one must say no. The moment the good requires victims, it ceases to be good. 
To win one's moral independence, one must uphold the individual's moral right to exist, beginning with one's own. The founding fathers grasped politically that no one gains a right to your life by virtue of his real or alleged superiority. Neither priest nor king nor aristocrat nor the majority gains a right to your life by virtue of superior social position, position, mystic visions, ancestors, wealth, or numbers. What must now be grasped morally is that no one gains a claim to your life by virtue of his real or alleged inferiority. No one gains a moral claim to your life by virtue of his inferior wealth, power, happiness, intelligence, ability, knowledge, or judgment. What this means is that your moral stature is not at the mercy of someone who has failed or perhaps could not even be bothered to provide for his own health care or retirement. So politically, the Declaration of Independence taught us to reject the notion of undeserved serfdom. Morally, Atlas Shrugged teaches us to reject the notion of unearned guilt. Atlas Shrugged accordingly offers a new conception of the moral ideal, a new conception of the sacred and the exalted, far different from that of the Sermon on the Mount. Fundamental to Atlas's new moral code are the actual requirements of life and happiness. Central to its new ideal, therefore, are the virtues of thought, production, and trade. Remember Jefferson's gallery of worthies. Who were some of the individuals included in it other than himself? Philosophers like Francis Bacon and John Locke, scientists like Isaac Newton and Benjamin Franklin, political thinkers and men of action like Voltaire, Turgot, and Thomas Paine. In Ayn Rand's terms, men of the mind. And this in a nutshell is the greatness of the American Revolution. It was the possibility of such ideal men that served as its motive power. And the tragedy of the revolution is that Jefferson and the other founding fathers still thought of Jesus as the sublime preacher of the Sermon on the Mount. What Atlas Shrugged shows is that the choice is either or. And more, it shows us that Jefferson's gallery of worthies are worthy of that which they had never been granted before, moral respect, moral admiration, and moral esteem. Now to all of this, to whatever... So uh, one thing that I really want to emphasize uh, and encourage people to do, as they say on the internet, read the whole thing or watch the whole thing. It's available both in text form and you can see the whole talk. Uh, Keith, I think you actually did the Q&A session with Ankar for this back in 2007. And we'll give yeah, information toward... <laughs> we'll give information at the end about where you can, where you can find a copy or watch the whole thing. But um, one of the things you'll see if you do is that Ankar says a whole lot more about how the conventional Judeo-Christian morality of self-sacrifice can't answer the, the bold questions that Ayn Rand asks of it. Or uh, if, if we can figure out how it would, if it were pushed, the answers that it would give reveal just how corrupt it is and how it's an anti-morality kind of morality, how it's an anti-life morality. So for more on that, I, I definitely want to encourage people to watch the talk. I think it's a good thing to do uh, on this Independence Day. But it's also worth pointing out that um, just like, uh, as you pointed out, Keith, the founding fathers weren't just rebelling for the sake of rebelling, they were also envisioning a new positive alternative uh, the same is true, I think, here, and on, I think Ankar shows how it's true in the Declaration of Independence that Ayn Rand is, in effect, declaring uh, when she writes Atlas Shrugged. She's not just asking critical questions about the morality of self-sacrifice. She's not just pointing out its contradictions or how it lacks any basis in reality. She's also, very importantly, uh, constructing a positive alternative of her own. And relevant to what we've been discussing today, the, the new morality that she proposes, the new ideal that she holds up, is one that uh, reflects not just in its method, but in its content, uh, the value of intellectual independence. So it's not just that she's reached this new uh, proposal for what morality would look like, what she calls the morality of life, by thinking independently for herself. It's that the very content of the morality has central to it the value of the independent mind, how what it means to live in accordance with a moral ideal is to use your mind independently to create new values, to produce, to trade, uh, to live the life of uh, production and thinking that, that Ankar mentions toward the, uh, the last excerpt, to, to be like one of the people in Jefferson's gallery of worthies uh, who, uh, you know, the morality of self-sacrifice would not allow to appreciate just how valuable they were. Yeah, and it's, but it's, I think 
it's it's um, there's an emphasis on on independence, but just to be really clear on what that means, it's not what people sometimes think of as sort of atomistic independence. You go off and you be a hermit living on your own. So you think for yourself, you produce and create new values, but uh, you know one of the one of the, the third value that Ankar says in his talk is trade. And this is this means win-win interactions with other people, voluntary exchange to mutual benefit. And the values that you get by being an independent individual in a society, you know, are enormous. So, I mean, I, th I think um, these are some of the things that Ankar pulls out at the end of his talk by way of giving an indication of the positive alternative that Rand offers to the Sermon on the Mount. And of course, you can find her own positive statement of, of her moral philosophy and her novels and her philosophical writings. Um, um, but I, I also want to reiterate, it's, it's uh, I think that I remember this talk from Ankar being extremely valuable. I don't, I don't think my contributions to the Q and A were, you know, worth, uh, you, you can stop before you get there. I mean, it's tough doing a Q and A with Ankar because he always answers questions so brilliantly. <laughs> but, but the talk is definitely worth watching, uh, and it's a great way to celebrate Independence Day to watch that talk. But we were going to wrap up with um, uh, with another. But we don't have a video excerpt here. We have uh, we have some text that you wanted to focus on, right? No, I, and but before I read the text, I just thought I would comment on something you just said about the uh, how the the form of independence that the form of intellectual independence that Rand upholds is, is not what you called atomistic. And that speaks to something that came up at the very beginning of our broadcast about how the way that this ideal is often undercut is by suggesting, no, we live in an age of interdependence. And it's worth pointing out that that idea is, uh, it works as a kind of package deal because it draws on uh, the obvious fact that we benefit by living in society, by trading with other people, by learning from other people. And so that's offered as the, that's the sort of, uh, that's the bait in the bait and switch. The switch is then to say, because we benefit by living in a society, therefore we should uh, surrender our intellectual and political independence and be uh, forced to deal with certain people, uh, to be forced to engage in certain kinds of trade, to be forced to uh, learn certain things uh, to give up uh, our resources to other people, and that's that's the package deal that that Ayn Rand helps to challenge and unpack by showing that even when you are benefiting from others by trade or or, or learning, you still have to be the one at the end of the day uh, to do the work. You still have to create a value that you trade with others. You still have to do the work of understanding what it is that other people are teaching you, because at the end of the day, we are all uh, alone in our own minds, uh, facing reality, and other people can't do uh, our thinking or our living for us. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't come together with others to see things that are valuable. And so that, that gets us, I think, is a good transition to uh, celebrating Independence Day, because it's an interesting thing that we all do get together with each other to celebrate the fact and importance of our own independence. And I thought we would close today with uh, a passage uh, from Jefferson himself uh, when he was uh, close to the end of his life, they were approaching the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence and there were to be big celebrations and Jefferson was not in good health. And so he had to decline an invitation uh, that was given to him to attend the celebrations in Washington DC. And it's, it's I think, uh, eye-opening to look at what he wrote in the letter to uh, Roger Whiteman uh, uh, on June 24th of 1826, uh, where he had to decline to attend. But here's what he had to say about the significance of the Independence Day celebrations. He said, uh, may it be to the world what I believe it will be, to some part sooner, to others later, but finally to all, the signal of arousing men to burst the chains under which monkish ignorance and superstition had persuaded them to bind themselves and to assume the blessings and security of self-government, that, uh, that from which we have substituted restores the free right to the unbounded exercise of reason and freedom of opinion. All eyes are opened or opening to the rights of man. The general spread of the light of science has already laid open to every view the palpable truth that the mass of mankind has not been born with saddles on their backs. 
not a favored few, a favored few booted and spurred, ready to ride them legitimately, but the grace of God. These are grounds of hope for others, for ourselves. Let the annual return of this day uh, forever refresh our recollections of these rites and an undiminished devotion to them. And I think it's important to point out about what Jefferson himself said about these celebrations. He said, all eyes are opened or are opening to the rights of man. And I think that in his time, that was correct. But as, as we have discussed today, it, it looks like in recent decades, uh, the eyes have started to shudder uh, to the rights of man. And I think that speaks to the second half of our conversation today about the reason why they've shuddered. And it's because the founding fathers themselves and uh, the Americans who followed them did not exercise that same degree of intellectual independence. They didn't use their reason to question these, the moral premises that are, that are at odds with the values of the declaration. And here I'll have to mention one more passage uh, from Ayn Rand commenting on the significance of the Declaration of Independence and, and why it is that it's had such a, te such a tenuous hold on the American mind. She wrote, if it is ever proper for men to kneel, we should kneel when we read the Declara Declaration of Independence. The concept of individual rights is so prodigious a feat of political thinking that few men fully, um, few men grasp it fully. And 200 years later have not have not been enough for other countries to understand it. This is the concept to which we owe our lives, the concept which made it possible for us to bring into reality everything of value that any of us did or will achieve or experience. So it's, it's one of the reasons it's a difficult concept to grasp is because it depends on a repudiation of this morality of self-sacrifice that too few have been willing to repudiate. But so as not to end on a negative note, as long as there are still people out there who, you know, in Jefferson's words, continue to cherish the unbounded exercise of reason and the spread of the light of science, we can take the occasion of Independence Day to dedicate ourselves to advancing Rand's rational scientific alternative to the morality of self-sacrifice. And I plan to do it this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Uh... I, we have some time now for questions. We've uh, gotten one already from Super Chat. If you're on, if you're watching on Zoom, please uh, feel free to plug a few into the Q and A module in Zoom. Otherwise, we'll continue to monitor Super Chat for any questions uh, that come in or any other questions that come in through uh, through uh, YouTube. So. We have one Super Chat donation asking the following question: Will the achievement of 100% laissez-faire capitalism in America? be a holiday worthy event or will it happen so piecemeal that nobody could pin down the date it happens? Uh, I mean, this is, this is projecting some time in the future where the culture has improved to the point where we can start, uh, start implementing political change in the direction of, of the right kind of political system that we support. I mean, what I would hope is that this is um, there's a connection to America's history in, in this event and that the people doing this on the, on the occasion where there are moments, you know, particular moments that represent significant steps forward, you know, they could, they looking to America's history, they could, they could take those steps on the 4th of July and connect it with, with America's history. So, I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know that we could really answer the question definitively, but I would think there would have to be steps like, like the Declaration of Independence, like um, you know, uh, I mean, the other significant events in the founding of the country and so on. What do you think, Ben? Well, I would say in a way we already have that date uh, if what Ankar is saying in his, in his lecture is right and it's 1957, uh, if, if, the, if Atlas Shrugged really is the first document that declares independence from uh, the morality of self-sacrifice, then, I mean, there's a reason that uh, he gave that speech on the 50th anniversary of the publication of that novel, just like Jefferson was being invited to the 50th anniversary of the, dec of the first declaration. Now, it's true that uh, having uh, released that book into the world is not the occasion of uh, the 
uh, erection of, of laissez-faire capitalism and a, and a fully free society. But, but keep in mind at the same time um, that neither was 1776, neither was July 4th, 1776. Uh, it was uh, the, 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 the Revolutionary War took many years. There were many years after that uh, before there was a constitution that fully embodied and protected the values of the declaration. And if you want to be uh, really serious about it, I think you can't bypass the fact that it was another hundred years uh, before before the idea that all men were created equal and all had these rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. It wasn't until 1865 that that was really implemented after the Civil War. So uh, we we can celebrate for the same reason that we celebrate the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, even though the American ideal had not yet been fully implemented. I think we can still, you know, celebrate if, 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 if what Ankar argues for is right, Atlas Shrugged is, is one of these milestones. And hopefully there will be uh, more of these milestones in the future. Do we have other questions? Because if not, we can draw a line here and and uh, I don't see any. Start preparing so our we're preparing our celebrations for the weekend. Yeah, I think it's I think it's fine to stop here. Uh, so let's let's share some resources with uh, with our audience. Uh, first of these, I believe, is the the talk by Ankar that we've been. Uh, recommending that you take a look at. This is called Atlas Shrugged America's Second Declaration of Independence. And we created a short link for you. If you go to bit.ly slash second declaration, I think that takes you to the YouTube version of this talk with the Q&A. Uh, if you do a little more Googling, you'll find there's also a PDF uh, text version of this talk that was, I think, released on the occasion of the, the Tea Party movement uh, distributed to them. Uh, I also read briefly a passage from Ayn Rand on the subject of the Declaration of Independence. And that passage was from the second resource. That's from her uh, Fort Hall Forum talk, A Nation's Unity. If you go to bit.ly slash nation's unity, you can listen to that talk. And that talk is uh, a very interesting exploration of the ways in which uh, the uh, American polity has, has uh, decayed from the ideal of uh, individualism and individual rights. Uh, and, but with also a, uh, a really fascinating theoretical explanation of what individual rights are and why they play a role in the very kind of national unity uh, that, that sometimes looks like we have when we celebrate on, on Independence Day. Uh, last of all, I believe there was one more. Oh, no, there was no more. But uh, so those are some resources. Let me now take a moment to remind everyone about uh, next week's episode of New Ideal Live. Uh, this will be a conversation between you, Keith, and uh, the other senior fellow at ARI, uh, Ilan Giorno, on the subject of was Ayn Rand a conservative? And we talked today about how uh, conservatives and libertarians, among others, have, even while thinking they were on the side of the American philosophy uh, undermined their defense of that system uh, by their reliance on uh, religious morality of self-sacrifice. That will be one of several topics that I believe is discussed in this question of whether Ayn Rand was a conservative next Wednesday, July 7th at the usual time. And uh, if you would like to be able to follow us in the future, if you liked our episode today, if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to this channel. Click that bell button if you'd like to get notifications whenever we go live. If you're watching the recording of this on YouTube, please consider leaving a comment and liking the episode. Those help optimize the algorithm so more people will see uh, this episode in the future. Same story if you're on Facebook. Please like or comment on this episode. Uh, share it with others if you if you uh, want to uh, celebrate Independence Day in the way we've been suggesting. And last of all, if you have questions or comments on this episode that you'd like to share with us, please consider sending us an email to newideal at einrand.org. We read everything that comes in there. We answer many of the questions. Sometimes we uh, do special episodes on topics that were suggested by viewers, and we also save up the philosophic questions that we get for special Q&A episodes. So this is the place to send that if you'd like your question answered either on or off air. So I think that will wrap us up. Uh, thanks uh, for joining us today, Keith. And uh, thanks everybody else for, for joining us. And I'll just uh, sign off by saying a very happy Independence Day to all of you this weekend.